Um, and we're all, uh, so I'll treat this as a recording, not just for you, but also for our archival uh, documentation. Mm -hmm. So if I, maybe I'll be a little bit more explicit than I would if we were just, you know, ch chatting right next to each other without being recorded. Absolutely, um, no problem. And that way it's a useful video, not just for you, but for other people too. Absolutely. Okay, so we, um, our, our project is to move a really large file from one really remote well, computer to another pleasure. remote computer. And those two remote computers are both managed by DigitalOcean and they show up in this nice little list. So yeah. um, our old waiting. server is called TCV COG. It's located at this IP address. Uh, our new server is called CNF CITF, which is the number you're familiar with now. Yeah. Um, and I believe yours is called something different. Did we even ask? And what would that be? So you'll have to check the Etsy hosts file. Okay. So let's verify yeah, I, what I your. Sure I just got to get uh, it's a newer setup. Right. Should I send it to you or Jimmy? Your Etsy host says. So jump onto your terminal okay. and you'll be able to use. Okay. Uh, so we're going to cat out Etsy hosts and that's going to tell you what your that particular computer's mappings are between the IP wow. address. We're they naming were the IP them. address, so oh, right. it's only a convenience. We could always use the long form of the IP address, okay. uh, but yeah. it's a lot easier to remember they letters for humans than it is IP addresses. Yes. So we just name them in one place, and then anytime we want to use this number, we just use this name. And the nice thing about it is it lets us do things like SSH edarso at cogdrop and I had it set up to automatically so authenticate me. So all of a sudden with one click, my yeah. terminal is now at our old server, our current server. So we can go look mm -hmm. at that and say, okay, see, this is the big one. It's got eight gigabytes of RAM. Oh, okay. No uh, one's doing much of anything. Okay. And so I've got, we're connecting my local computer whose mm -hmm. name um, yeah. is it? So this will get a little bit confusing because her name is yeah. Sylvia. And so on the prompts here, yeah, my local computer local is Sylvia at the computer name Sylvia T430. So the user and the computer's name both have the name Sylvia. Okay. Um, and this is really important be because the database itself like has a user yeah. called Sylvia. Okay. And the reason for that is that the database that we're using is called Postgres and Postgres okay. um, was written on Linux for Linux machines. And so to make the login process really yeah, yeah. seamless, mm -hmm. you have a database user who has exactly the same username as this, the computer's user. I see. Okay. okay. We and might need to go over that again because I'm yeah, not that's quite what, sure about that's my what, diagram, but yeah, that's, why, that's we're why we're recording it. Okay. We're all synced up. Um, so um, so let's connect to the database. This is the, this is the database that we're trying to copy to the new server. Um, and it, it's a many, many gigabyte file. And so it's not as, I, I, I ran out of space last night when I was trying to save it to the computer, even though I have seven gigabytes of free space. So the file is larger than 7.5 gigabytes, um, which is surprisingly large. So okay. what that means is we have to do some backflips mm -hmm. to extract the information from this old okay. server, our current old server, without, um, mm -hmm. uh, without raising the size on the digital ocean so if it if worse comes to worse we just have to pay for a bigger server that we're just going to turn off um, in a second um, uh, but you know, so we're, we're trying to learn how to i'm trying to learn so that the team knows how to move really large files we've never had to do this before okay because this was our old original server and our data our database is only large because of the files and the images that we're saving so the original three years we weren't saving very many images Okay. So the files never got too big. So I could just save it and move it. And it was just like any other file. 
Okay. Um, but now it's huge the, because um, of all it has built packed into it one, all of those files and photos. Like they really and we call those blobs. Like that. And that's so blobs are the, um, uh, binary large objects. So it's just a bunch of ones and zeros. It's just mm -hmm. file data. Um, so what we're gonna do is I uh, yeah. I'm gonna become the user Sylvia on our old um, on our old server. Yeah. And then I'm gonna log into the database and I'm going to so see now who am I? I'm <laughs> I'm Sylvia, but I'm Sylvia on our first server. I have uh, to be careful because my local system here, my laptop, is also Sylvia. Yeah. Um, so I have to be really careful that I'm always looking mm -hmm. at which computer I'm talking to because now I have three different computers I'm talking to and their shells are all kind of on top of each other. Okay, so Sylvia at 430, 430 is my laptop. Your laptop, okay. And Sylvia, uh, so what you want to look at is who's, it's at what. So the computer's name is after the at sign. So this is the old server, TCV COG. This is the new server. I'm edarso at so I mean? cnfcitf. So this is the new server that we're trying to move the data to. Okay. And this is my laptop. And then I have a couple of duplicates because this is the firewall configuration. So I can I'm logged into the same computer on different tabs, and to the remote computer. Um, it doesn't care that these are two separate tabs. It could be two humans on different continents. So okay, they're completely they're, separate right. conversations with the, with the computer. Um, so that's very handy because um, I, what we're doing involves both networking and a bunch of different tools and uh, the database port connections. Yeah. So what yeah. I'm planning to do is I'm gonna run a small script on my local machine, Sylvia T430, and that script is called cogpgconnect.sh. So notice in order, when, when a file has mm -hmm. execute permissions with the X there, remember that from yesterday? Yes. Then it's, it warns you that this file is, is a program that can do things to your computer. So don't do something silly unless you like, know what you're doing. It right. even makes the file bold and it puts mm -hmm. a star. <laughs> well, is that why? Yes, it's saying okay. this is an executable thing. So notice, take a look at this. I also have a file. So these are mm -hmm. just these are just shell commands in a file. So if I catch CNF, they're very short, and they let me run a command. But see, when we're doing database backups, it's following the same pattern as that we learned yesterday. Except look at all these flags. All of these little switches are a piece of information that we're passing to this program to download mm -hmm. the entire database into a huge file called a tarball. Oh, that's what you were referring to in that email this yep. morning. The tarball yes. is, a, is every single piece of data in the entire database in one file, and we move just the one yeah. file, and then the other database slurps it up and unpacks it and rebuilds the entire database from scratch. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I'm gonna have to keep rewatching this and rewatching this, so, yeah. okay. And, and look this up. So if you're like, what is this? So go to Google and say, What's look at the name of the program first. This oh. is PG dump. It's a program that's designed to go into a database, pull everything out, put it in a huge box and let you ship it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's, it's only used for moving a whole databases. Hence yeah. the dump. It's just, you. There's, you can't use it in that form, but you can move it in that form. Not um, that so that's very handy. Um, so notice that that is, um, this is a bash script in a single file. Now, if I normally, if I want to run a file, I just type a dot and then a forward slash, and then I type the name of the file. If it's executable, it will let me run it. If it's not executable, it'll say you don't have permissions. So watch this. So I just ran this file called Cog PG Connect, which is actually a program. And it's a small program. And, and you know, you ran this yesterday, except I'm connecting my local computer's port 220,000 um, to the remote computer's port 5432. So imagine a huge wall with a thousand outlets on it. In fact, it's a hundred thousand outlets and each outlet has a number on it. And it's one, two, 
a um, hundred and uh, some thousand. Mm -hmm. And th the database normally is in, plug if you want to talk to the database, you have to plug into plug 5432. But I need, I'm trying to plug my local plug through this magic tool into the port, the plug 5432 on the yeah. computer in New York. So I'm going to be able to tell my Sylvia, my local Sylvia, that port 20,000 will magically get you portaled to, as if you were standing in front of a computer in New York and you were plugged directly into its plug called port 5432. Okay. And that will let me connect to the entire database. So I can use a special tool called PG Admin that will visualize all the tables and all the data. Um, that's our next thing to learn about. Ooh. This is varsity level stuff. If you were a sporty person, you might say this is varsity level stuff. Um, so look here, these are all the different databases. So I'm gonna connect to, uh, my computer thinks this database is sitting right inside of itself, but we're tricking it. Okay. This database is actually in New York. Okay. That's why it says local host. 20,000 local host means my local thing, the computer right in front of you. Okay. Uh, and so this program is letting me see, look at all the pretty tables. These are all the tables we're familiar with, like a CE case table. That's where the cases live and citations live in citation. And the uh, ordinance is called the code set element and it lives in there. See, it has all of its nice little um, min penalty, max penalty. So this is the, this is the data itself in a very nicely viewed form. Have you seen you seen um, systems like this with the nested lists? Yeah, yeah, of course. And this is what is this what you opened when we were uh, working on? We were removing. Um, I think we created a extra unit or a extra permit file, and we yeah. went in. Is this this, this so is this or this? Okay, this is it. And so the um, since you're familiar with this structure. The important thing to remember is that we're inside a schema called public. Um, and so when you initially, when you open the database, you have to snake your way in. You're, you, sometimes you'll just see how DB, like, well, mm -hmm. where is it? Where is everything? It's schemas public, and then you have tables. Um, and then inside the tables, you have the columns. Okay. And then I can, the key thing is when you right click the table, that's where all the goodies are. So you right click yeah. the table and then everything is in there. View all rows. Okay. There it is. That's the actual data. You can edit it right there. Okay. Um, you can screw stuff up really fast by editing the keying yeah. on these tables. So we're going to figure out the right permissions to make sure that we don't make mistakes. Because right okay. now we've only had one database administrator and now we have two. Suddenly we have two. So okay. we have to go from uh, you know, I can remember what I do, but suddenly when you have two brains that aren't connected, we just have to coordinate. Absolutely. And, and the way we're going to coordinate is by making users that only can do the things they're supposed to. And if you need to do something different, then you make a user that does that. Is that go into the uh, being able to read and execute? This is database level. So the, that's exactly right on the, sh on the shell on level, okay. on the but operating not, system not level. The, okay. In the database, it has its own rules and those, oh, are, okay. those are read write permissions. There's no such thing as execute permissions in the database itself. Okay. There is read write permissions at every level. So you could go all the way down to um, user, uh, user A can write description only and user B can write description and creator, but nothing else. Like you can go, you could make permissions all the way at that level. And right now we don't have any, uh, we, we don't have a comprehensive permission policy on this database. So okay. if we worked in a, or if we work in a corporation, you'd have to build that from the beginning because you'd have multiple people from the very beginning. We're going from a single manager out. And so we're gonna have some uh, and that'll be a really fun thing for you because that's a great way to learn databases by, is by configuring the database that you're then going to use because then you'll have learned how the thing works by building it, uh, building the permission system. That makes sense. Okay. Because one of the things we're going to need to be able to do is we need to connect the app to this database and that will also involve a database user that is specific to the app only. 
Okay. And so you're, you're going to get to work with Sitian to figure out how to get the right database yes. permissions. Um, and that's good because I think the two of you have a lot of uh, complementary skills. Great. I'll be looking forward to that. Um, she, is, uh, she is learning. I think she is very, she's very good at finding technical answers on, online. Okay. And that'll work really well with your understanding of code and so code and force as a whole. Because I don't think she knows the, the she doesn't know much about the inspection interface that we built on oh, our I end. See. And that's okay. what's going to connect up with the dispatching. Oh, great. That'll be a neat little project to make sure that um, the users are going to coordinate through the dispatch table. Um, and that should be a point of um, it's called uh, OCK Inspection Dispatch. OCK Inspection Dispatch. So that that's how we say, okay, this is ready for an app to do it. Once they finish it, they will be writing different timestamps into the dispatch table. Um, and that'll be, I have a, a strong feeling that a lot of debugging will still need to happen. So a lot of when we say testing the app will involve you refreshing this table and watching it change as the app is used and making sure that the stamps happen in the right places in the right order. Okay. So when they pull it down to the app, we need to timestamp retrieval. When they push it back up, and they the we timestamp sync. And then if we want to delete it, we never delete anything. No one can ever get rid of data. The only thing they do is write a deactivation timestamp and who did it. So that even, even if you want something to disappear, it's never actually gone. Okay. No, no, sense. there's no database operation that faces the user that ever gets rid of rows. Um, you can mess them up, which is almost as bad, um, <laughs> but at least they're not gone. Right. Um, okay. That makes uh, sense. So that's, now, what we just did allows us to then extract all of this database information. I'm going to save it to, it's kind of cool because I'm not even saving it to my local hard drive. I'm saving it to a network drive that's in the room next door that's shared across all the computers in the shop. So I needed to be here to use that network drive okay. um, because that has terabytes of storage, thousands of gigabytes. Um, and so we're going to, this is a little bit of a backflip because we're going to be pulling every piece of data through this SSH tunnel. And then my little horse, local Sylvia, is going to crunch it and crunch it and crunch it and then send it all out to the network drive here in my shop. And then we've got to ship it all the way back up to the new server. Because I tried to connect the old server to the new server directly, and they didn't have enough space between them. Oh, I see. Um, OK. So, so this, I have to okay. run the file locally and pull it out. They can't do the generation because they have to use a chunk of space to organize all the data okay. before they put it in the crate, the tarball. And so that means that the computer needs like probably twice or three times the actual size of the files in the database. It needs to have a bunch of free space to set up the, the shipping. Um, see, look, here it is. Could not write tar archiver, could not write to output file, no space, space left on device. So when we run the PG dump command, see how it's gonna go through every table? Oh, oh wow. It okay. goes through every single piece of data and pulls it out one row at a time in a way that it will be, and it's the, the program that slurps it back up was written at the same time. So PG dump knows exactly how to work with the PSQL tool, which lets us talk to the database through the command line. Um, so they, they link up really well. Um, so let's how, see if, how long does that usually take? It's going to take hours. Okay. Uh, if, if it was local, if it was on a single system, it might take 10 minutes. Okay. But because we're pulling it through this network and through all these little hoops, um, uh, it's going to take hours. Okay. That's what I figured. It seems like such a, yep. okay. um, so we're, we're going to get it started and then, and then that'll give you a sense of where this all goes. Okay. So we're going to now say, so I have a script on my local Sylvia. Local Sylvia is here. So I say, hi, local Sylvia. These are all the, these are like custom 
commands that are just batched in that shell shell script. So I can cat that out and say um, cnf back.sh. Oh, look, here it is. This is telling PG dump to find me a database called CogDB, which is the name of our database. The user's name is Sylvia. The role's name is Sylvia. Um, we're going to ask it. We have to edit this script because I do want to ask it for the password on the new database or on the old database. So I'm going to come in here. This is just what we did yesterday. So I'm going to say nano and then the file is CNF back. What's the difference between CNF back.sh and all these other ones? Uh, CNF backsh. Well, is it going to be your permissions? Exactly. What, what's the difference in permissions? Why isn't it bold? Oh, because it's not, you can't execute it. I can't even execute my own file. Because you're in the shell, right? Or no, you, you set that, you set it up that way, right? I set it up that way. Yeah. Um, okay. I didn't actually set it up that way. The people that made it force you to do an extra step so you don't accidentally make programs that wreck stuff. So I have to actually come in here and say chmod my user owner needs to get execute permission on cnf back.shell and now you'll see it's bold and i have my lovely little x so now i can run i can all i have to do is say dot slash cnf back dot sh and it would be as if i sat there and typed out this whole long thing so this is just a this is also just a convenience and that's what you're going to learn how to do is package up that ssh forwarding command that's on the top of the sheet that you did that we did yesterday yes. you're going to put that in its own shell file okay and then mark the execution bit so that you can run that really quickly anytime you need to connect have that okay. wired up that way you, you don't have to remember all the details you just have to remember the name of the file and say cnf back.sh so okay. now we're not done because we need to edit um, did i take out the no password, so I'm just editing this switch. There's this particular switch I know I need to take off. I do want it to ask for my password. Um, notice it's going to ship it out in tar. Now notice this is really important. See how I have the blobs flag, a flag okay. on? Yes. That means download all the photos and documents. Make it huge. If I took that off, it would be a manageable size. But we need all of it. Okay. This is a full, a full, uh, a full migration. Um, so we're going to keep that blob slab on, flag on. And now where do we want this to go? This is the wrong place for it to go. We actually need it to go into my network storage drive, which is called NAS for network attached storage. So I'm going to pull up, uh, I'm going to go back. This is my local t Sylvia T430. This is just me talking to my local computer because I need to figure out um, where my network drive is so I can tell it where to put this huge file. So I think it's in media, my username. I think it's uh, network attached storage, CD mass. Yeah, here it is. So here's my warehouse. So we want to put it in warehouse CNF. So we're going to okay. say warehouse CNF. This is my huge hard drive next in the room next door. The permissions on this are wild. Look at this. Hi, because it's a network drive, the permissions go all wonky. This is a really interesting, oh. it's just like every file in every directory is automatically executable by everybody. And the reason that's not a disaster is because the, the network mounting tool will only let you, you can never execute. It doesn't care where the file is. Even if the file remotely is executable, okay. yeah, just let me it know. does its own round of permissions checking. All right. okay. um, but it is something that I need to fix. If I had any other human using this network drive than me, I would have to fix it right away. Oh, okay. um, but when you're doing stuff solo, once again, you, you can get away with being a little sloppy because if you wreck yourself and that's bad on you. Um, but if you, you and each other, you can't be wrecking each other's stuff. Right. Um, so I, this is my, where I need the big file to go. So I have a couple, this is, this is not a, one way if you get desperate is you can copy and paste the path, but that's not a good idea because um, you sometimes won't have a mouse to do that with. So you should learn how to do it just by moving, by navigating the file tree. So that's why having, 
nice clean directory names helps a whole lot because I need to pop over here and I'm editing my backup script. Um, where are you? Here. I'm trying to, I have to remember where that pathway is. So it's media, Sylvia, NAS, warehouse, CNF. And then we need to make a place inside of there. So let's go look at that. Um, so notice I'm just changing tabs between my, I could be jumping between two conversations with my own operating system. Sylvia at Sylvia T430, this is my local laptop. I'm editing a script in one tab and I'm navigating the file system in another. So don't be afraid to have a few tabs. It, it makes your life a lot easier. Super okay. duper Linux administrators will use an extra tool. So they're bouncing between shells inside the same command prompt uh -huh. and they're using their keyboard to switch between them. And I, I, if I did administration all day long, I would certainly go that route. Okay. Uh, but I, I'm kind of a reluctant administrator um, because I like the programming more than the administration, but you have to do the administration to the program. Um, so let's go inside here and see. Oh, look, there's nothing in there. So we're going to make our own. We got to come up with. Uh, so we're going to call this uh, DB, Pog DB migration. Nice, simple, all lowercase, no spaces, no weird characters. Um, helps a whole lot in making, fixing typos. Because every typo, you have to open the, sh the script again and, and run it. So right. uh, it's nice to just uh, use lowercase letters. <laughs> <laughs> um, as yeah. you're learning. I remember that. So now I can come back here and just say db cog db migration. I don't have to bother with copy and paste. And then I'm going to name the file. This is not on my local computer. It's remote. Um, and it's the whole database. And are we 27? And it's not this year, it's 2022. The extension actually doesn't matter. This is a tar file, so I'm going to put tar on the end. Um, but it doesn't actually matter. It's convention. Some things it really does matter, but often you can get away with uh, weird extensions. OK. Um, but extensions help someone else, including yourself, a year from now know what's in the file. OK, so I just wrote that out. I saved it. <laughs> And um, now I'm going to run it okay. and we're going to see what happens. So it should ask me for my database password for the remote database. So let's see if it works. So dot slash means I can run this as if it's its own little program. CNFback.sh. So if I auto complete it, it knows that it's a program. I just hit tab. If I hit enter, whatever's in this file is going to run. If there's dangerous stuff in this file, whatever permissions my user has on this computer, this whatever's in this script has. So don't ever run a shell script from someone that you haven't examined and you trust. Okay. Ever, ever, ever. Um, because it would only take seconds. If it had a, if it, it would download malware, it would run the malware, the malware would ask for your IP address, it would ask for your internal networking configurations, okay. and then it would flush itself out. You'd never even know that it happened. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and Linux doesn't need antivirus software because the permission system is really robust if you follow it. Uh, if, if everyone was doing command line stuff on the Linux, you'd probably need extra software to help people not screw it up. Um, so it's interesting on that standpoint. You just got to know how it works. So let's okay. see what it says. Um, looks like it didn't need a, a password. Now it's going to go through every table. Oh. And it's going to hit the blobs here in a second. We'll see what happens. PG dump. So this is the name of the program. And then it's just really handy because it's giving us a log output of what it's doing. And it's going to hit blobs and it's going to, and it's going to pause. And then that's what takes the time. Yep. Oh, okay. Let's see, it read the large objects. And now it's dumping contents of table, public blob bytes. This is the big one. And that's what we're going to wait for an out of memory message. Now this is kind of cool because we can now watch the network do its thing. So I can come here. 
Um, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna pause recording. I'm gonna pull up my password files. Um, so now I can talk to you directly. So you're gonna to want to keep a, a, a password file that's okay. password protected. So okay. when you on Linux and Microsoft, you can save a password for Word documents and um, in on Linux the Office program is called LibreOffice Writer. It's installed by default. Um, so you're seeing all of all. Of, this is all my secret stuff in here. Okay. So I it still says recording in the upper left. It's it's paused. Oh, oh screen okay. sharing is paused. Oh, that's good. So people can't see it. And they can hear it. So I made. Uh, I'll describe what we're looking at. We're looking at a table that has the name of the computer, and then on the right, I have all the different logins. So this is. DigitalOcean new 22.04. This is our new version. See, the old one was 16. It I don't open. see that. Oh yeah. Okay. So I'm just describing it. So okay. I'm making, I'm making a, I have a, I'm looking at a list of my, my login and password information. Got it. Okay. Um, and so uh, what I'm looking for is a, uh, I have several of them. I have my life split into different files so that I don't have business stuff mixed in with personal stuff okay shop stuff kind of overlaps because i run a small business so yeah. i i can use part of that file structure for saving business stuff uh and others is personal and that that's, there's just some crossover in, in there that's smart um, so i i do that by i try to keep it separate by having the roots of the trees are separate so I, the warehouse cnf is going to be completely separate than my personal warehouse okay um, that makes sense. And, um, so and I, I, a, I know it's probably going to be important to start, you know, having, using them like different, different ones. Yep. Yes. And especially if you start working with interns and you're the keeper of all the secrets. So mm -hmm. you're, uh, I, I encourage you and Amanda to figure out how you can carve out time to design. You're going to need to come up with your own systems for managing passwords to these various components and figuring out how to keep records in a way that um, uh, makes sense for you and how you organize your your life your life and your your information um, okay. because it'll stack up fast there'll be dozens and dozens um, over, over not too long from now okay and okay so what I did was I um, we're gonna go look at my network drive. I, I like networking stuff. I'm not much for configuring all the nitty gritty. I like getting the big things to work and then using it. So I can connect to my local network storage drive and I can watch it move all that, shovel all that data. Oh, that's cool. And it also can help me figure if, if it takes, you know, it might get stuck. It's hard to know because I'm not getting byte by byte output um, so I don't know where it is in that table. What I, what I am going to do is I'm going to watch the size of the file. And if it doesn't change size for a long time, um, I might have a crash something. And there's lots of pieces that could potentially crash. Um, and so figuring out if data is moving to the drive will help me figure out if something is actually crashed or if it's just waiting. Um, sometimes you have to wait on the network. And so the hard drive is just sitting there. Sometimes the hard drive is waiting. And you, sometimes it goes the other way around. The network's waiting for the hard drive. Um, okay. So I'm copying my username and password to get on to my management console for my network attached drive. Now I'm in. So this is a, this is cool. This is its own computer. This is the remote console. So notice, look, I'm on a local network. This is inside my house. Okay. The 10, 10 dot IP addresses are local. So I am connected to my um, network attached storage, my big beefy hard drive. It's actually a pair of hard drives. So they keep a copy of themselves all the time. Every time you write to one, it just copies it onto the other. There's no need for a backup because it's always exactly the same on two separate drives. Um, and so it's a it's a it's a device that its only job. See, look how cool it's. Look how much 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 it's moving. So we're moving a whole bunch of uh, uh, data 
because we're going across our blog bytes is being written across the network. Um, Did if you I, start recording again? Yep. Okay. Um, and uh, and so what we can do is we can open this up. Um, so there will always be a steady increase. Uh, let's let's take a look. Uh, I'm trying to blow up the. This. Because I don't, I don't do other. Oh, so let me double click. I don't normally do resource managers, and you know, I'm used to eight. Okay. I, was, yeah. I gotta chop that out. That was my password screen. Um, so here's network. So it's pulling. It's reading in sixty-five kilobytes a second. This is relatively slow. Um, the the bottleneck is the is the network translation through my local machine. So uh, maybe when we get off Zoom, I'm going to look at my local machine and see Sylvia might actually be overwhelmed just moving on. See, look how overwhelmed Sylvia is. Oh, I see. Sylvia is yeah. out of RAM. Her, her, look at her processor. Her, every one of her four cores is over 60%. So I'm Zooming and I'm running Java. So I've got it. I've got it. Sylvia's burning up. Um, okay. So I'm going to, we'll, We'll pause. The, we'll end this call and free up some Zoom. Zoom is a beast. Okay. Um, and so I'm gonna. I just closed NetBeans. Oh, look! Did, see, Java's gone. See how it freed itself up a bit. Yeah. And now it's Zoom. Okay. So Zoom. Look how complicated Zoom oh, is. Oh wow. Because Zoom has all this stuff to do. It's. It has to send my video out. It has to bring your video back in. It has to figure out. I'm um, screen sharing, so it has to figure that out. So look all these little processes. They're all different numbers. And they're all part of this Zoom tree. So if I turn on F5, see Zoom, if we go look for Zoom, um, Zoom has a huge tree. Zoom's going to be this big tree. Look at browsers. Browsers are beasts. Every tab has its own process. And then every tab inside that has its own process. Browsers, and look, look how much Zoom has. So if you went to the main Zoom and hit kill, it, would it? shut us all down or is there a possibility something could stay on oh you bet that's the end yeah call okay. the call is over that's exactly right um now hopefully the zoom see zoom serve zoom the reason everyone loves zoom is because zoom servers expect and can cope with this so they're actually able like you've seen how i remember like if the host leaves they mm -hmm. can just kind of pop back in and everything's okay yes you know, it, it it's like, all right, we know the host just disappeared. We're gonna assign a new host. Like we're not gonna cancel everyone's meeting. Like they do, they've done a really good job to realize that networks sometimes drop off. And that could be because someone accidentally hit F9 with the cursor right there. And so Zoom server maintains a, it maintains a really careful log of the, the most recent state of everyone on its network. And it can help people restore it. Um, the network tools we work with, um, I could probably yank the cable out, and if I plugged it right back in, it would be okay. Okay. Um, like I could, I I might be able to walk out of a a wireless hot zone into a dead zone and walk back in. I couldn't yank this cable out, drive to you in Monroeville, and plug it in because I'd be using a different pathway onto the internet. Okay. So. Um, one reason I stayed home is because this might take 10 hours and I can't just go back, uh, and, go back and forth. Yeah. So um, we fired that up and uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay, cool. Well, I will stay tuned. And can you send me this so I can keep reviewing yep, this one? I'm going to chop off the last five minutes because I showed my password screen. Yeah, no problem. And what we did yesterday, I'll keep working on. But yeah. so your goal, is a, your goal is a diagram of this what we've done here. Okay. All right. Okay. I could do Sounds that. Sounds good. Talk to you All later. right. See ya. Thanks. Bye. Bye.